Good afternoon and welcome to Have We Got Kind News For You. Uh, thank you all very much for joining us both on the live show and those catching up later on YouTube or one of the various podcast channels. Um, we uh, ask you, as always, to consider making a charity donation in, in lieu of a uh, registration fee. Uh, as regular viewers will know by now, our uh, favourite charities are Brian May and Anne Brubber's Save Me Trust, uh, the National Energy Action, the UK's leading fuel poverty charity, Shelter of the Housing Crisis, the Ukraine GoFundMe page, or of course, a local charity of your choice. Now, we are absolutely delighted uh, this afternoon and evening um, to welcome to a we got news for you, uh, Linda Hasey, uh, the leader uh, of uh, East Hertfordshire District Council, um, who's uh, been in the news recently uh, because the council which she leads has, has got through a very substantial garden village uh, in former Greenbelt land, which we'll hear about a little bit later. Um, Linda, hello, good evening. Thank you for joining us. And can you tell us the usual questions? Um, where are you calling us from? Um, what, if anything, have you chosen our theme? And what, if anything, are you drinking? We encourage that, of course. Of course not. No, I am in the office and we're not allowed alcohol in the office. So, you know, let's let's be quite um, clear. But I do have a glass of water and I've got a piece of cake, which I can come on to later. So how did I get here? Um, first of all, I just have to say I'm not a planner. I'm not a lawyer. And I'm a politician by a, a phone call. So uh, <laughs> someone phoned me up about 18 years ago and said, we think you'd enjoy being a councillor. It's about four meetings a year. Um, it's very easy. So um, I took the silver bullet and um, that's how I'm here. And the rest is history, as they say. And the rest is history. Uh, uh, yeah. Fantastic. And, uh, well, we're looking forward to having a, an in-depth discussion with you in the second half of the show, which I'll be leading. I'm really, I was really looking forward to hearing your, your thoughts on political leadership in, in the field of planning and all things in that vein. Meanwhile, we have our panel. We're going to present the various uh, case reports. So let's introduce them. Starting as always with Mary, um, back in town, legal I can see. Yes. Good afternoon, Charlie. Uh, Mary Cook here, sitting in the town legal offices here in the city of London. And oh, well, it's delightful to be here. Lovely to see you all. Um, and welcome to the show, Linda. And I'm drinking water too, Linda. Fantastic. Paul, oh, how, how are you doing? Uh, I'm very well, thank you, Charlie. Hello, Linda, although you seem to have vanished from my screen for some reason. Uh, uh, we've not frightened you off already. <laughs> um, so I, I'm currently, believe it or not, in my my eldest son's bedroom uh, in Jesmond in Newcastle uh, for reasons involving him having a rugby injury and uh, various other things. Um, so uh, I'm not drinking at the moment because I've got to drive back to uh, to home after this. However, I have acquired something called which is almost made for me, something called Tuckbot 2000, made by Brewdog, <laughs> recommended to us by one of our viewers, and it's uh, walnut, chocolate, and vanilla imperial stout. So next time I see Sasha, I'm going to take it down, and Sasha can try this one rather than me drinking this garbage. It's Tuckbot 2000. That, no, it makes sense. Absolutely revolting. So, we see oh, like, have, uh, have you got any of the specialist Dominic Cummings from uh, Brewdog, have you? Oh, we did. We had it on the show. John John Bower, a very good fan of the show, a friend of ours. He sent one in the the eyesight. Um, how much it was called now? But yes, there we, we. I drank it live on air. <laughs> and and my, my my route home will actually take me through Barnard Castle, so I will stop and make sure my eyesight's all right en route. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, um, Chris, where are you? I'm Charlie. Hello, Linda. Uh, I'm in Hemel Hempstead. Lucky me. <laughs> and. Uh, what is lucky is that my inquiry today was in the hotel. I mean, it wasn't in my hotel room. That would just be ridiculous, wouldn't it? But it was in the conference rooms downstairs. So I've had a very easy commute. And this is turning into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, isn't it? Because I'm on the water as well. Nice to be from us, Chris, as well. I'm not sure the knot on your tie is big enough. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Double wins that. Absolutely. Sasha, good evening. Good evening, Charlie. I'm in Kent near Swanley, and I have actually got, as you can all see, the ugliest piece of Nutella art in the history of mankind. But <laughs> I don't want any of you to think that that's the last present Claire gave me. It's actually I'm in a hotel room, but I'm very chippy that Chris seems to have a nicer hotel room than me, so I'll have to rectify that pretty quickly. <laughs> Linda, I hope you noticed this. We've both got those of us who lifted to wear ties we've both got blue ties on i i'm flattered and i've got blue glasses on as well so, you know, <laughs> then, uh, 
Well, I, I've taken my tie off. I've been I've been in Western Supermare this morning for a, for a meeting in a case manager conference. Which I had to wear a tie on, which was blue as it happens. And I've taken it off now. Charlie Banner here, back at home in London. And um, so let's kick off with our um, with our case reports. And uh, so first up is going to be Paul, who's going to tell us about a. Um, a Greenbelt case where the appellants managed to establish very special circumstances despite their legal representation. Um, so, so tragically, there are a couple of problems that I have in terms of telling you about this case. The first of which is I'm stood up. Um, the second of which is I'm now getting to that age where I've got to wear my reading glasses. So I feel like I'm declaiming as, as it, the election begins the old days of inquiries. Um, so yeah, so, so this is a case involving um, a Section 78 appeal. Uh, in which it, the inspector Wilkinson uh, issued a decision following an inquiry in December of last year, uh, at which uh, one of our panelists uh, was involved, the one with the greatest glare on the screen at the moment. Um, uh, so he it was an allowing he allowed an appeal against refusal by Buckingham, Buckinghamshire Council uh, on the twenty fifth of April of the previous year in respect of a scheme in the Greenbelt, and it was outlined permission for three hundred eighty dwellings, a hundred unit. Uh, retirement village, a 60-bed care home, uh, plus also a community hub and land for a primary school. Big scheme, 29.7 hectares uh, in two parcels uh, separated by an area of ancient woodland which would be enhanced and uh, uh, managed. And it was said to be a reimagining of metro land in a nod to Sir John Betjeman, which I have to say goes way, way beyond my cultural knowledge and references, but shows you what a cultured man Sasha White's uh, KC actually is. A uh, few others would have dropped that into an inquiry, I fear. So the inspector concluded that the development, unsurprisingly, was in a, inappropriate development in the green belt and by definition harmful. Um, and that harm had to be given substantial weight. Uh, there would also be further harm by virtue of loss of openness. However, he did observe that that openness needed to be tempered by the fact that it was a largely contained site. And he also concluded limited harm to the setting of Chilton, uh, Chilton's AOMB. But, and this is the big but, he concluded that there would be very special circumstances um, because the benefits, he concluded, clearly outweighed all harm, including the Greenbelt harm, including the definitional harm to Greenbelt, because there was a pressing need for new housing due to the, quote, chronic shortage of five-year land supply, um, and there wasn't sufficient uh, brownfield land available to accommodate uh, uh, those needs uh, within urban areas. At the time of the base date of the assessment, it was two and a half years, but it was likely to be diminishing to 1.8 years uh, in the following year. So it's a declining five-year land supply as well. Um, now, the, there was an argument which you often get at inquiries of this nature of uh, death by a thousand cuts. Allow this, and then the next bit will, will come forward as well. Um, however, the inspector said that was undermined by the absence of there being a green belt review um, and was also compounded by the fact that... Um, Within Buckinghamshire, when there was a consolidation, there was an abandonment, or uh, rather a withdrawal of the Chiltern and South Box local plan. And the inspector concluded the, the emerging local plan, which might have uh, addressed the uh, the shortfall, was, quote, several years away. Um, it, it's straightforwardly said and explained in terms of uh, at the nature of, uh, of the inspector's conclusions, but it's a really important case because it does flag up, as did Secretary of State decision last December in York, that in the right circumstances where there is a need and where it's not likely to be addressed in the near future and where harm to the green belt is more limited than it might be in other instances, that need can, under current guidance, outweigh uh, uh, the uh, the adverse effects in terms of green belt and other harms and amounts of VSC. It's a very important case uh, and no doubt it's being trotted uh, trotted off uh, around the country at the moment. Quite how that will stand up in terms of amendments to, to MPPF currently being churned over by government, who knows? However, it's certainly one that's well worth a read, if only by reference to 20th century poets. Thank you, Sasha. Thanks, Paul. Therein, therein ends the lesson. <laughs> uh, well read, Paul. Uh, thank you. Well done, well done, Sasha, indeed. So watch this space for any further um, green belt decisions that may be pending. Now, over to Sasha himself, and you're going to tell us about a decision in a place called, or racing to a place called Grove. I am. I'm going to take you to the Vale of White Horse, which is one of the loveliest names for a local authority in England. And I'm going to deal with a decision of the 30th of March from Jonathan Bohr. Now, Jonathan Bohr probably, those of you who recently appeared in front of him, is probably, in my judgment, the quickest and 
most fourth rides inspectors, and I say that as a compliment on the circuit currently. Jonathan Ball was considering an appeal by David Wilson Holmes for a proposal for 300 dwellings. And there were two main decisions before the inspector. The first was what was the effect, of course, of residential development on agricultural land. And the second issue was whether the Vale, the White Horse, had a five-year land supply. The situation in the Vale of White Horses, those experts and um, people who are familiar with it will know there's always a question of whether the housing land supply is disaggregated between Didcot and the rest of the Vale. And that was a major issue that fell before the inspector. Now, sometimes, notwithstanding the most brilliant advocacy and the most brilliant evidence, sometimes inspectors just don't like proposals before them. And I think the overriding sense I get from this decision is the inspector just didn't like the scheme. And he concluded that it was effectively, he used the quite strong terms, of unplanned sprawl against the proposal and significant harm to the countryside and landscape. So on the first issue, the inspector's clear conclusion was of significant harm. In relation to five-year land supply, the inspector concluded, unfortunately, that the local housing need was the correct figure and that in the light of that, the council had about six years housing land. And in that consequence, obviously applying the flat balance, the clear view he took is that the harm to the landscape and the countryside was great enough to outweigh the benefits that had been argued by the appellants. And he also addressed the question, because of the dispute on housing land supply, he also had that very, very difficult ride at the end that even if he's wrong on the tilt of balance and it did apply, he would still take the view that the harm to the countryside and the landscape was of such great weight that it would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits. So, um, pretty pretty powerful conclusions on landscape harm in the particular context of that appeal by Jonathan Bohr. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Sasha. Without further ado, over to Mary to tell us about a case related to Harwich. Yes, thank you very much. So this is a decision of an inspector dated the 10th of March uh, um, earlier this year. Coming up now, you'll see Inspector Rachel um, Pipkin. And it related to a proposal for 109 dwellings on a greenfield site and the site was 130 meters beyond the settlement boundary of um, Harrietsham on the Ashford Road. And you can see on the dates that the application had been made in March of last year was refused in June and um, at the, the, f the first problem that the um, appellant faced was that when they lodged the appeal they submitted a reduced scheme uh, for 86 a maximum of 86 dwellings, and they sought to get that scheme um, in front of the inspector and have the appeal determined on that basis. But in paragraph 10 of the decision, the inspector applying Wheatcroft principles concluded that people um, who would have been consulted on the change development um, had been potentially deprived of that opportunity uh, and that the amendments um, would materially alter the nature of the application. And so declined at the outset to allow the appeal to be determined on the basis of the smaller scheme. So there were five reasons for refusal. Two of them uh, were, were um, dealt with before the um, hearing. Highway issues were overcome and there was a visual uh, issue about acoustic screening that was overcome. So the main issues were firstly whether the appeal was in a suitable location bearing in mind um, that it was outside of Harrietsham which, which itself was a rural service centre. And the inspector um, took the view that there needed to be a very good reason to disturb, as it were, the development plan policies which focus development within the settlement boundary on the one hand, whilst protecting the countryside or on the appeal site. And also the local plan policy required a, a judgment to be taken about the sustainability of the site and the inspector found that although um, there were some facilities which would be within a walkable distance and indeed a footpath was being provided on the A20, fundamentally the A20 is a busy road with quite a lot of HGV vehicles and she concluded in short that the site was not a suitable location and was therefore contrary to various development plan policies. She then moved on to the second issue, which was about the development uh, and the impact on character and appearance. And again, in a nutshell, 
the inspector found there would be significant harm to the character and appearance of the area, and therefore, you guessed it, the proposal would co- was contrary to other development plan policies. And um, in particular, the inspector then went on to look and see, which, identify which were the most important policies um, in the development plan and what weight she was going to attach to those policies. And this is an interesting curiosity. The local plan requirement figure was 883 dwellings per annum. The standard method figure was acknowledged to be higher. But this was a council that had a surplus of supply. And because they had a surplus of supply, the inspector found that the settlement boundary policies were not out of date and that, in fact, there was no evidence that they had not been, that they weren't succeeding, as it were. So that was a, a major blow uh, to the appellant. She also uh, noted that the local plan review was well underway. Reg 19 uh, plan was at examination. Um, and so she didn't accept that any of the policies uh, which the appellant had been advocating were out of date, were in fact out of date. And these were the most important ones. So then she came to housing land supply. And again, another interesting fact, in the context of um, a five-year requirement and a 5% buffer, um, that, that sum was 6,000 odd, but the oversupply was over 2,000 units. So a significant oversupply. And she found that the oversupply ought to be taken into account in the five-year housing land supply re- calculation. Now, there's no guidance on that in the MPPF or the PPG, as we, as we know, but she concluded that it, it should be. And although there was a, um, a lot of dispute about the sites in the supply and she knocked off some 700 odd from the supply, um, the fact is that she found that there would be a five-year housing land supply and taking on board this additional oversupply and that would be the case whether, in fact, you um, approach the oversupply in a, if, if I say a sedge field approach, forgive me for being technical, but I, I've got limited time, whichever way you skinned the oversupply, whether you applied it just in the five years or whether you applied it throughout the uh, plan period, they still had more than a five-year housing land supply. So she applied an untilted balance and she found that the benefits did not outweigh the harms. And so she dismissed the appeal. Thanks, Mary. Um, interesting about the tough, the, tough gig, I might yeah, say, tough gig. Indeed, um, interesting discussion about the in about the amendment. Uh, one can't blame the inspector for referring to an applying to Weecroft because that's what the planning inspectorate's guidance, which she referred to, uh, mentions. But the guidance actually doesn't deal with the Hoban Studios case, which came out more recently and which recast Weecroft quite substantially. And, does seem to me that at some point in time that guy is going to have to be updated otherwise it may have legal implications yeah i mean uh, indeed indeed but i mean this i i I found that aspect of the decision a bit curious because she says i I, i've come to the conclusion um that 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 there would be um prejudice she said this is because the technical assessment supporting the application and upon which the benefits of the scheme are derived are based on a scheme of 109 well, it was the whole be, site. It was but, a I mean, an application. That's an amendment. It doesn't believe it's a breach of uh, weakness. I found that reasoning, um, I have to say, um, unconvincing. Yes. Anyway, a good thing John Lytton, who did that case, is in Australia at the moment. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, last but not least, Chris, you're going to tell us about a case in a place called Hurst. Um, I am. I am. But uh, just on that point about Holborn Studios, Charlie, I mean, the answer is always, as we know, uh, Paul was done a scheme recently with an amendment, is you consult on the amendments. Uh, and if you have to make amendments to the design access statement, that's what you've got to do. So Holborn Studios is no impediment. All it is is what we've all been doing for years. Exactly. To consult, on the, consult on the amendment. But I agree with you, Mary. I think, you know, uh, I mean, is it, uh, I know people are looking at that case carefully because of what it said about taking into account the oversupply because the MPPF draft changes are doing that. Well, that's not policy yet. Now, Sasha's has found an interesting case as a, as a counterpoint in respect of that. Um, Sash has found lots of interesting cases that are where he's won. He's found us three cases where everybody else lost. And um, <laughs> just teasing. And, uh, and as a consequence of which, I'm going to talk about a case that's been lost. So I'm bringing up the appeal 
in respect of his, I have to say, uh, Sasha, well done in Little Shelf. That is a fantastic result. You have succeeded where others have failed and um, such, a, such a significant uh, issue. Um, if you don't take land out the green belt like Linda's done, then you end up just having it granted on appeal. And that's a lot more expensive. Now, in my case, uh, it's Hurst, if, um, if Rob can just bring up the, uh, the case. Uh, and you can see it's 200 homes an open space uh, at Hurst in Reading. And this uh, is a McTaggart and Mickle uh, uh, development in Wokingham Borough. Now, Wokingham is really interesting. I think Wokingham is an example, frankly, of if you get a plan in place and it's ambitious because it's got four big strategic development locations, then you can reap the rewards of turning down or making sure that lots of applications are turned down and you'll be backed up at appeal. And I think that's evident in this case. It's the same issue as Mary's just dealt with, the oversupply, but the inspector approaches it in a different um, a, a, a way. So if we go, first of all, um, to the next, uh, to paragraph um, 17, I think it is. It's a, it's a, I won't bore you with all the facts, but it's a greenfield site. It's just a field um, and uh, it's on the edge of the settlement. And what the council said was at the time, uh, what the inspector said was at the time the council determined the application, it considered it did have a five-year supply in accordance with the framework. However, the appellant disputed that, and although the matter wasn't fully agreed between the parties, at the time the statement of common ground was finalised by the opening of the inquiry, the council had accepted it could only demonstrate a deliverable supply of 3.95 years. So here's a council without a five-year land supply, so we know the consequences of that. It should trigger the tilted balance and means policies are out of date. But if we have a look, if we go on to the next paragraph um, that I've selected, we can see from paragraphs 28 onwards what the inspector's approach was in dismissing the appeal. So there's no dispute between the parties that the housing requirements set out in the core strategy is outdated. The policies and the settlement boundaries detailed in the core strategy and the local plan, uh, the, the um, allocations document uh, to achieve delivery of this quantum of housing discussed above must similarly be regarded as out of date. So no five and supply, dealing with it properly, everything's out of date. But the inspector says it doesn't automatically follow that the development plan is failing to accord with the requirements in paragraph 60 to significantly boost the supply of homes. And if you've been to Wokingham, you've done appeals like me and Sasha and, and uh, several others, then you know that they've got these huge sites that are delivering at, uh, at Shinfield and at Arborfield. And so the inspector looks at not just the five-year land supply, but the reality of what's happening. If we go to the next paragraph, on the first of these points, I've been mindful that the council's evidence, which shows that over the 16-year period, from that was the start of the core strategy in working in 2006, it's achieved a total of 12,465 homes, uh, compared to CS policy, core strategy policy CP17, which required 10,700 and 38. So look at that. They they don't have a five and supply. They've had a number of years where they haven't, but they've oversupplied against their uh, development plan. And, and the inspector describes it as an oversupply of some 1,727 dwellings. And that factual position wasn't in dispute. And if we go to the next paragraph, we can see the inspector acknowledges that within the 16 year period, there's been more years when the actual completions fell behind the policy requirement than exceeded it. You can tell that's the appellant's argument, isn't it? You know, where you've fallen behind more often than you're ahead. But it's the appellant's accepted in closing submissions. Such delivery profile is not expected and expected where the bulk of housing relies on a small number of very large sites. You'll get fits and starts. You won't necessarily deliver it all in the early years. And uh, the inspector describes the delivery as lumpy. <laughs> uh, if we go to the next paragraph, on this point, I've noted the council's assertion that further housing delivery from the SDLs, the strategic development locations, is very likely to add to the supply over the next five years. But the, whilst this may prove to be the case, I cannot place weight on this matter. Well, quite rightly, I mean, it may deliver in all five years, but that's what you've got a five-year land supply calculation for, isn't it? Is it in the five-year land supply? But if we go to the next paragraph, uh, or we'll continue that paragraph, I don't consider it's unreasonable to have regard to the council's assertion that if projected completions over the remainder of the plan period were to take it take, taken into account, the total completions would be 15,448, which is much higher than the core strategy requirement of 13,233. In other words, they'd over-deliver against the core strategy figure. It's only a minimum, but that's a significant 
exceeded to over 2,000 houses, in which case the dwellings considered clearly are considered deliverable and there's no good reason to doubt that they will be completed. And if we carry on to the next paragraph, the uh, the conclusion is it might be in, in view of these points that even though the council is currently unable to demonstrate a five land supply falling short by 863 dwellings, I don't consider it reasonable to ignore the bigger picture, which is that there is a very strong likelihood that the council will achieve a significant oversupply of dwelling completions over the whole of the course st strategy period. And that mind, uh, to my mind, that does not signify a council that is failing in terms of housing delivery. Well, welcome to the future. Uh, both Mary's case and mine. If the council, if the government's amendments to the MPPF come through, an oversupply is taken into account, which councils like Linda's would say, well, hang on, we've been delivering lots of houses. Surely when we oversupply, that should be taken into account. And uh, that is what the inspectors are starting to do already, even before the MPPF. And so what it tells us is get a plan, get a plan in place and deliver your housing need. And then you'll be boosting supply and you'll fight off appeals. So, um, Linda, um, welcome. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you again for joining us. You told us uh, uh, earlier about how you came to get involved in, in local sort of government. Can you tell us, before we sort of explore um, some of your, your more recent activities, what's, what's the role of um, the leader of a council and certainly your role as leader of the council in, in the planning council? You're not the head of chair of the planning committee, but um, ha how have you treated your role better than planning? I believe that as a leader, um, developing and creating and making sure we have a district plan in place was the one of the most important things I should be doing. Um, as a leader, I gave the whole process some credence. Um, we recognised that it was extremely important for our residents that we had a district plan in place that was deliverable and uh, had gone through due process. Um, so I'd always been somewhere along the line in the last 18 years involved in the planning processes, although never a chair of the committee because I was always on the executive. So I think it's um, it was just a role that I carried on doing. I see. And of course, you've been uh, seeing in the news and there's been a high profile interview with you by, by Kratos recently, podcast, uh, in the context of, of your council's um, recent grant of permission for um, 8,500 homes a wider um, uh, garden, garden community development on former Greenfield land that I'm um, almost sitting in the kind of Green Belt land. Green, no, Green Belt land. So I mostly Green Belt land, at yeah. least in your local plan uh, a few years ago. And um, I'm interested to hear more on that, in particular, um, noting that other local authorities have famously repudiated Green Belt releases either by undoing proposed plans or, uh, or in other ways or deallocating sites as in happening in some places and indeed in other greenfield developments why and how do your council avoid that temptation and and see it through despite no doubt some degree of opposition um, locally oh yes there was considerable opposition and i think in fact about 40 percent of our development in strategic sites has been allocated to green belt which had to be taken out of green belt policy um some of it is uh, town extensions, but most of it are big sites of two and a half thousand, and in this case at Gilston, 10,000 dwellings. I think I felt that it was very, basically it came out of, you know, our objectively assessed needs, which was 19,000 homes going up to 2033. Um, and the only way I could, we could do it was actually by bringing forward the Gilston site. The Gilston site is two parts, so there's a uh, bigger portion which is owned by Places for People, and that's the site that went through a planning um, a couple of weeks ago, and I'm actually sitting next door to the DMC committee, which is uh, cogitating over the other 1,200, uh, 1,500, uh, which is a, a Taylor Wimpy site. So it's, um, which was a separate application, obviously. I think I felt that on the whole, some of these bigger sites are much easier to develop because you've got the critical mass to ensure that you can get the infrastructure which needs to be associated with these developments. And we have had people come to us and say, oh, I've got a bit of land here. Can we put 50 houses on it? And you say, oh, 
A, we don't need it because we have got a district plan with the correct number of houses allocated. Um, so 50 houses or 100 houses actually delivers very little infrastructure. But if you've got these big sites, you can plan them properly. You can use proper garden city principles working with the TCPA and come up with something which is properly planned and can be and should be um, community led with the involvement of the community. And just on that point, I mean, uh, you, you mentioned already that unsurprisingly there was a degree of, of opposition to it. And and I'm aware also there were some people who were saying it, it should be done, but done in a different way. Um, so how did you manage the sort of public consultation and community <laughs> for development such a massive scale spanning, I think it's three, isn't it, local authority areas? It's three, it's three local planning authorities so it's, and hollow in Essex, two um, county councils, Essex and Oxfordshire County Council and two NEPs. So it is a very complex um, delivery model uh, organisation to deliver ultimately through the Garden Town process, uh, Garden Town uh, 23,000 houses, of which Gilston is obviously the biggest portion. With um, lots and lots of meetings with parish councils, um, we had maps, we called them all in, we spoke to them without planners present. So it was just myself and our chief executive talking to them about the impact that we believe it would have on their um, uh, existing communities, but also the reasons why we were doing it. And I can remember we used to sit around and we'd perhaps have a dozen parish councillors or residents in a room and we'd, I'd go around the room and we're in Hertfordshire and say, where were you born? And they'd, one person might say, well, in Hertfordshire, one person might say within district Hull, within the district. And I said, we are the problem. We are the migration figures that actually have been taken into account in looking at the five and 10 year uh, migration figures, which then derives the um, ONS. So we started out working with the, the Gilston people um, and residents. Um, and we had Saturday morning after Saturday morning in a very cold village hall, underneath a banner which said stop Harlow North because that's what Gilston was called at the time um, and this was way before we got the district plan sh through. I think that it is once we had got it through and it was adopted by council it was then much easier to go to these groups and say look we now have an adopted district plan this makes it very different we want to work with you to ensure that we actually have really high quality developments. We have the um, authority to, to make sure that we can work with developers to push that quality forward. So therefore work with us to ensure that we actually are able to achieve it. And we, um, so that's been going on for years. We now have a thing called the Neighbourhood Plan. Gilston did a, an extensive neighbourhood plan working with their um, uh, uh, local, uh, their uh, sister village, Hunston. And, you know, it's, and we still meet monthly. And I've said to them, even though I won't be here, you know, the important thing is those meetings with uh, the developers on board, planners, councillors, and residents continue even after the first bait goes in the ground because you are the people who know these applications inside out. And these are the forums where we can go through issues, you know, enforcement issues. They're not doing it right. Okay, let's nip it in the bud to very early stage um, before everyone gets very frustrated and then just whinges around saying, oh, well, the council's not doing anything, is it? So, um, so uh, that's where all the engagement came from on the Gilston site. Now you said uh, earlier on that um, this, all of this was sort of derived from ultimately the need to, to uh, address objective assessed needs. Of the, the approaches of some other Greenbelt authorities have been to say, "Well, we can't, we can't. We'd like to go AN, but we simply can't. We've got too much Greenbelt or too many other constraints." You didn't take that approach. So I I'm interested to hear, you know, what you see. Uh, how? What's the knack? Um, what advice would you give other uh, <clears throat> members um, on how to reconcile meeting needs on the one hand, but on the other hand, retaining the credibility of the planning system in the eyes of the public? Is there, is there a sort of gold rule or gold set of principles or anything like that? Any insight you can offer others on that difficult issue? 
I think you just have to have the vision because, you know, you we, we've heard from the, the case studies that you just highlighted this week, this today, if you don't have the vision and the the five year lads apply and the sites who are and in the adopted plan, you get done too. And we do have a number of towns uh, outside the green belt, beyond rural areas, beyond the green belt. And um, before we had a district plan in place, there's a particular town called Buntingford, and we had no control over what was going on there. And we turn it down because it wasn't appropriate, it would go to appeal, and it would get approved. And so Buntingford basically over the last five, going into the next five years, were double in size without the associated infrastructure uh, done on a coordinated way. So on all our strategic sites, we do do master planning, quite detailed master planning. It's one of our district policies and some one of the big developers, one of the big four said, well, we don't do that. And I said, well, if you don't, you won't get permission because it's one of the policies in, in the district plan. So we sit down with developers and we go through it. And basically what it means is that once you, you iron out a lot of the issues in a closed meeting and everybody's involved, we get county council officers, etc. So transport, schools. Not the NHS, but we won't go into the NHS. Well, we can if you want to, but I mean, it's um, it, it's a process that uh, has worked very well for us. And that vision, um, some people might say, and I, I read, I, I'm in the school of thought that I'd, I prefer not to express a public view. But some people might say that the um, the draft changes to the framework have only been being consulted upon um, give councils the opportunity to duck that vision and and be less brave than you've been um do you have anything to any observations on that and indeed do, any observations you'd like to share with us about the proposed changes in the framework to plan making and green belt well i I, th I think the changes do not actually say you can't do it you just have to be able to have the evidence as to why you do need to do it and there will be authorities like epic forest for example which have serious constraints because of the ownership of the forest through the London uh, city of London, the um, oh, sorry, city of London. I think it's um, you know it, again. I think it's somewhat you have to be in control somewhere along the line. You have to say, will I be done to, or do I control what's going on? And I think once we had that district plan, and we are still able to say to our residents, we have a valid district plan. We know what will happen where, she says very naively, and we are able to support development where it is appropriate. And I think that's the thing is you, as local authorities, planning authorities, we have to be in control of what goes on, not the developers. And as, as, a, um, as, a, as a conservative uh, leader and, and politician, um, do you think the Conservative Party is still the party of home ownership? Well, yes. And why do you say that? <laughs> because I think it is something that is very important for, for young people to, to be able to have that asset behind them uh, throughout their lives. And it also adds a degree of stability. And once you do start having children, it provides them with the stability and a place to spare home. However, I think there is a real need to make sure that we have the balance right because not everyone will be able to afford their homes. Um, and again, what we have seen historically is people take out significant mortgages when the interest rates are low and then have difficulty later mm -hmm. on. So we do need to have policies which do specify so affordable housing, social housing, and again, it is of a high quality and working very closely with housing associations to make sure that it is the right developments, hopefully pepper potted through development through new sites, but I understand the reasons why it cannot. Um, so we um, we need to, uh, it, it's the balance of housing um, and that obviously changes with time and demographics. 
Thank you. One last question for me, and then I'm going to open up the floor. And and that's on on joint working. Gilson's a good example of yeah. the three authorities. Um, the duty to cooperate looks like it's on the way out, subject to the levelling up bill. Any any insight, your reflections you can provide us with how how local authorities can best work together to deal with strategic planning issues. Is the duty to cooperate the answer, or was it the answer? What about regional planning? Is it more <clears throat> personalities and leadership? Your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, we were part of the um, Schmarf, which included Harlow, Evan Forest, um, and Uttlesford, which is not part of the Garden Town uh, scheme, and a little bit of Broxbourne. And I think it worked for us because there was that, you have to have leaders who have a degree of trust. So the Schmar worked for us, and from that came our relationships, deep, deep relationship with Harlow and Epping Forest, to actually work together to get funding from the government for creating a garden towns, which is the Harlow Gilston Garden Town. And it it does come down to be able to be very honest with each other. Sometimes the politicians sit down over not a glass of water and discuss things, but knowing that actually we will then go forward because whatever your colour as a local authority, I do believe that we are all here for the quality of life for our residents. And I think that's the key that you have to hold on to. So I think, yeah, they're not always easy, these discussions. Um, but I think ultimately, for everybody's sake, you have to do it. Because again, it comes back down to controlling rather than being controlled. Thank you. Thank you. Really interesting. Well, let's open up to the floor uh, and obviously do, I've seen a few questions in the, from the public as well in the chat coming. Um, Sasha, I think you're first up. So over to you. Thank you, Charlie. Linda, can I ask, one of the key relationships in planning is that between members and the officers. And I just want to ask you from your experience, how do you think we can get more traction from members towards officers? their professional judgments in the planning system? I believe that one is you have to have um, DMC members who are very well trained, who see their job as looking at um, the policies of the applications and whether or not officers have argued the case that these policies are being um, um, adhered to. We do a lot of training with our DMC. Um, we draw on a lot of site visits. So, for example, on the the, the, uh, the Harder Gilston one, the Gilston site, we did two site visits. We had to look at where the bridges were going to go, the new bridge and the expansion of one bridge. Um, and you spend all morning doing it, all afternoon. And then there were three or four briefing sessions and working with the chairman of the DMC, we said, if you're not at those briefing sessions, you can't sit on that committee. And I think, again, we've got a good record of when things do go to appeal, um, mostly the, the appeals are dismissed. Um, and it is, it comes down to, yeah, education, I think, members being seen that they're being taken seriously. We really do push the apolitical nature of a DMC. Um, and I think that sometimes the politics, some places I've seen can come into play, which is not helpful to anybody. Thank you. Thank you, Bo. Uh, Mary. Well, that, that sort of, that's a great segue, Linda, if I may say so, <laughs> into my question, because my question uh, is, all about trying to how how do we take the politics out of planning but to what extent do local government elections i ask produce politically led decisions that delay delay development and change as opposed to decisions based on policy and how can this be i say mitigated really what i mean is how can it be avoided how, how do you think with your experience we can how can we take the politics out of it well well we've got local elections in may um so yeah we we uh, obviously, are a conservative Ned administration, um, and some of those from other colours 
will stand up and say, well, we're not going to let this happen. All right. We, we don't believe we should have two and a half thousand houses being wrapped around where, even though it's in the plan, etc. cetera. Um, so I think there does tend to be quite a lot of grandstanding, obviously, in election leaflets. Mm. But I think in my experience, once you get people in, and I would spend as much time talking to my fellow opposition members as to my own conservative members, it's their understanding of what and why it has to happen. And the consequences of if you try to turn something over which shouldn't be turned over, uh, just what those consequences are. And, you know, as a local issue here, we can cite Arton Squid and Stasden Airport, which cost Arton Squid, what, two, three million, something like that, um, where there was absolutely no way that the residents um, for Arton Squid, um had the authority or the power to overturn an already approved uh, planning application although they said they could. And they soon learned very expensively that they couldn't. So I think, it, again, it comes back down to there's a lot of grandstanding around election times um, <clears throat> and um, once everybody is in place, you you have to start trying to diffuse it. And I know that um, you know we've got a, a bit of a backlog of some of our strategic sites coming forward in East Hearts and you know, developers were really pushing for these sites to come forward under the current planning uh, committee because the committee is experienced and it reaches balanced decisions. Um, but, I, you know, what I've said is obviously anyone who's going to come in to, um, uh, come in to uh, and want to be on the planning committee, and some people don't, um, they will be um, well trained. Mm. I think training is the big message I'm getting from you, as well as, as well as really political leadership. I, uh, um, you know, I I take my hat off to you as a as a, a leader, as a well, first of all, as a female leader, and and secondly, just as a leader who is interested in planning, and he's, you know, I I think that's great to hear. Um, and as you say, um, driving forward with your plan and putting yourself in the driving seat. Um, well, in many ways, this is what the government's trying to entice yeah. uh, councils to do. The government wants councils to bring forward more local plans. Well, the, one of the real yeah. problems of, of politics on all parties and in many countries in the last decade or so is the replacement of leadership. I, this is what I think I think, this is what I believe in, I'm going to do it, and then if you don't like it, vote me out. With followership, let me try and divine what's going to get me the most amount of votes next yeah. time. And, and, and generally those who shout the loudest. Yeah. I tend to do that, so I, I we, we commend yeah. the leadership. I mean, I, I I think there is a fine line between councillors who say I'm only here to represent my residents, mm. okay, but actually you have been elected to make decisions, and you have been elected as a district councillor, and sometimes those decisions are not easy or popular to make, but it's up to you to make sure, help residents understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. Absolutely. But, um, yeah, Watch some people just sort of... It's like you're standing down, Linda. <laughs> the oh, no, it's not. I promise you it's not. <laughs> uh, now, uh, over to Brewdog Paul. <laughs> Thank you, Charlie. And it's, it's uh, a joy to hear somebody extolling the virtues of representative democracy, which involves councillors being the filter and making decisions in the public interest. Uh, not simply parroting the views of those who shout loudest. So uh, I also take my hat off to you. Uh, and to be honest, Mary and I have been seen on this show wearing hats, so that's that's no mean uh, promise. Um, so I'm very interested in knowing your experience in relation to one issue that's certainly been a recurrent theme on our show, which is whether or not decisions are being taken at the right level of governance. In other words, uh, a district council who has the smallest of applications all the way up to huge strategic applications and following the abolition of regional guidance and it's non-replacement with any real strategic plan apart from why don't we cooperate with each other and um, are we taking decisions at the right level of governance or should there be an extra intervention to properly plan the super <clears throat> basis the whole unitary aspect is slightly above my pay grade at the moment i think let, let in hertfordshire 
all right, we have a thing called the Hertfordshire Growth Board, which is where all 10 planning authorities and the county council, plus the LEP, plus a representative from uh, the ICB, Integrated Care Board, sit. Uh, and it's a, a joint committee, so it's in public. And we spent about a year setting it up, working out what it was going to do. So in that organization, we do have the strategic projects which are necessary for the development within Hertfordshire. So one of the big projects was um, a rapid, mass rapid transport. And for anyone who knows Hertfordshire, it's very difficult to get from east to west. And you may be sitting in Hem or Hempstead, but that's probably where you're going to be staying at the moment. Um, so one of the things is to say, right, we work across all the authorities to make sure, and, and going into Essex, to make sure that we have the land set aside, that ultimately we will, will have um, a mass rapid transport. And also, and, and I think one of the big things that is coming out of a lot of the strategic site stuff is we have to get people's attitude to car ownership or car usage changed. Um, but that's a slightly different matter, and which is one which is which is at the forefront at the moment. No, I think some things. You know, I go back to the standard one that was probably best dealt with at a senior government level. You know, HS two. That's a a government decision. Um, you know, whether it's short, long, or not going to happen. So I think it's. Um, Things like that do have to be taken at a higher higher level um, and not necessarily just left to uh, a small or smallish local authority. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Linda. Just to let you know, the tie I took off was a red one, but I still take my hat off. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, um, Chris, you've got a, um, a very neutrally worded question, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, um Look, Lila, I mean, just fantastic. I, I'm a, you know, I'm as much of a Tory as Joe Lycett, Uh and uh, I, I am just amazed at how positive you are. Uh, I think it's fantastic. I just wish that Tory councillors everywhere were like you. You're so positive about the process, as Mary says. You're so knowledgeable about it. Um, what you say is so intelligent about new communities. I, I, I think it's just fantastic, and it's just a real pity frankly that so many people are running in the other direction scared to be confident what you said about being a councillor i mean you know don't stand just to be a nimby panda uh, and don't stand just to be pointless which is what seems to be a lot of councillors who just don't want to deliver anything uh i i just don't get that why why would you want to be a councillor and flick that on your own community my question though um, I was going to ask you about, you know, well, why, why, why go ahead with a plan? But you've answered that uh, several times over, which is your phrase, you know, don't let planning be done to you. You take charge of the process, take control. So my question really is about the home ownership point you were discussing with Charlie. Home ownership is is slipping in this country. It's in decline as a percentage. Uh, a large part of that is the focus on large urban areas where a lot of the flats that are being built are not. The home ownership they're built to rent and, and other models so um you know really what has the conservative party got to do to ensure that it is the party of home ownership because the labor party you probably heard this Keir Starmer is saying we are the party of home ownership we will take home ownership up to 70 percent if the conservative party wants to own this going into the next next election what have they got to do how do they show they're the party of home ownership Part of the problem around Hertfordshire is obviously the cost, the, the affordability. I don't mean affordable housing. I mean the actual affordability of owning your own property, which is why I had said that I believe there needs to be a balance. Okay, if, if you know, and and it's in Europe, not everybody owns their own home. It's totally acceptable to actually rent. Um, I don't think some of the policies that are now actually in the proposed levelling up bill um, help home ownership. Um, I don't think that um, developers help home ownership because if they only build out at a certain rate, because that's 
economic and commercial model, again, house prices per se will never fall, except there is if there is a general recession. They'll always be maintained at a level that they believe with, is, is necessary with it within the um, economic aspect of your county. What can they do? I think a lot of it can be pushed down to making the developers build out where they've got planning applications. You know, um, I know what well, it said last year, I think there was a lot of criticism of, of local authorities not for being the block on building. Whereas in fact, there is a significant number of planning applications which have been approved, but have not been built out. So I think that there does have to be, you know, a high level honest conversation with those government ministers who have close relationships with developers on actually saying, come on guys, get building. You swallowed the pill that is Greenfield Development, which will deliver home ownership, conventional homes, home ownership. There's lots of products, first homes, uh, shared equity. I mean, is the answer you've got to you've got to cut the earth, you've got to have some greenfield development because that's what delivers home ownership. Um, yeah, it's green belt. You know, and in, in in our air in my East Hearts District Council, you know, people say, Well, why don't you build on brown fields? So I say, Okay, well, where are they? We do not have any. Um and also brownfield sites are not necessarily cheaper to build on because of um, contamination. Also, if you start building on brownfield sites, often they are areas which are designated as employment. And we fight very hard to keep our employment sites for employment. And we will turn down, you know, some people come to us and say, oh, this is not feasible, I can't rent my... Um, units on this uh, on this uh, site and you say well that's basically because you've got done anything to it for 10 years because you want to get all the tenants out so you can say oh nobody wants this we're, we're, we're going to have to build some houses on it and we just stick to our guns and say no and we have so far been fairly successful and when you stop being a councillor would you mind standing as a member of parliament i no thank you <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, go on. <laughs> uh, that was my final question because you are standing down. Are we going to, is the planning world going to see you again? Uh, are you going to contribute or are you walking off into the sunset? Um, I have no idea. I'm moving to Scotland. I've got absolutely no idea what I will end up doing. Um, I have no plans. Um, I do quite a lot of planning peer reviews. So those I think I can continue to do for at least a year, which I really enjoy doing. Um, and I think, again, it's, you know, making sure that opportunities, if you see them, you take them, and if you don't want to take them, it doesn't matter. Good on you. Well, I, for one, hope we do see you in some shape or form um, in, in our planning world in future. Well, thank, thank you. For, uh, your extremely generous time and uh, fascinating and, dare I say, inspiring insights. Um, so thank well, you. Well, I've now... We'll go back. I will now go back into the DMC for Village Seven for Gilston, which is still ongoing, and um, we'll uh, see how we um, how we get on. Stop. I'll, I'll I'll send you a text as to whether it goes through or not. <laughs> is that the committee meeting? Is that a committee meeting? That's a committee meeting. Yeah, wow. yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Like, I'm sure. We started at two o'clock, and it's probably um, got another couple of hours to go. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoy a glass of wine at the end of it. Thank you, very much, and, uh, and thank you to our viewers. And we're taking an Easter break and we are back on the 20th of April, I believe. So we will okay. see. Um, cheerio and good night. Thank, thank you. you for the opportunity. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Linda. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.